Father, we come into your presence asking your blessing that as we gather, you would grant us the presence of your Holy Spirit to instruct. We come, Father, because here it is that we've known love, acceptance, forgiveness, restoration, encouragement, strength, calling. Here it is that we gather as part of one body, the body of Christ. We ask your blessing that you would give us insight and wisdom, grant us your will. We raise these that have been named, asking Holy Spirit with groanings too deep for words, pray that which we cannot. For Tommy, Nathaniel, Jack, Brett, Mark, Lord, for these that have been acknowledged with hands of faith, we pray for our children, our young people, for those that are separated from you, for any in harm's way, uh, for this anniversary of the attack at uh, Marshall County High School, and Lord, for all those who are victims of violence, we pray your peace for all of creation all that we pray, now and always. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Well. It's amazing to me how quick we forget. If you had not mentioned that, I have not seen anything about that. And if you had not mentioned that, I would not have remembered that. And we're just, we're just so quick to move on past things that have happened in our lives that have affected us so and I'm glad you mentioned it thank, thank you. you thank you 11 years in that county yeah. gave me a strong identity yeah. for that county that and I read the article this morning in the Tennessee <laughs> <laughs> well, I read my Jackson's it was on channel 40 <laughs> was it I didn't have it. I, I give God thanks for that because, yeah. you know, I've gotten to the place I can hide my own Easter eggs. I need yeah. Probably. Yeah. the etymology of the word remember yeah. is to member again that which has been dismembered. And really, that's what happens when we forget. We dismember. And, and I dismember a lot. <laughs> <laughs> And God is gracious enough that he remembers to us. I'm using that as a verb. He remembers to us things that allow us to have a sense of unity and wholeness. And God forgive me if I forget those that I have loved in that county. And they're not ever going to move on beyond that. One young man that was shot tattooed uh, a clock. The center of the face of the clock was the bullet hole. One of, the bu- one of the bullet holes, he w- I think he was shot twice, but one of the bu- bullet holes, I guess the one that was in the more appropriate place, he, he makes into the face of the clock and, and the hours, the hands of the clock are set at, uh, at the time that he was shot. Yeah. And uh, all these others uh, that have, it's strange that the officer that uh, was the only armed guard on the campus had to be a cousin of mine because his last name is the same as my grandmother's who lived, who was born and raised two miles north of the high school. And you know how small county is. There are certain names that are just common, repetitive in that county. And, uh, and that's one of them. And he, uh, he has to be a cousin of mine. And do we think about how scared our children are nowadays? My granddaughter, 13 year old, after that happened, she said, I'm scared to go to school. Uh-huh. You know, every day they're getting up having to face that. <clears throat> well, and we, we share that with our discussion about this door being locked yeah. during right. certain times. Right. And, yeah. and, you know, it just, it's gotten to be a scary place. Yeah. Certainly not the world we grew up in. We're not in Mayberry any longer. (laughs) 
We continue in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Last week, Paul introduced us to the idea of spiritual gifts. Now, today he's going to talk about the anatomy of Jesus. But under this, under all of this that I read to you in a minute, I want you to remember that the parentheses surrounding it is spiritual gifts. We could just as easily use these words to talk about race, nationality, sex, any type of modern identification of identity. You know, we, we identify as this or we identify as that. Uh, that's not what Paul's discussing here. He's discussing your giftedness from God, or in some cases, the lack of specific giftedness, because evidently in this community, certain gifts, i.e. tongues, have been raised up as being more important and others lessened. And so behind all of this is the idea of spiritual gifts. We started with it last week first 11 verses. We will conclude with it today. But that's what we're talking about. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all of its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as He wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I do not need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body. But it is, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffer, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret, but eagerly desire the greater gifts? And this is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. <laughs> Father, may the Word in my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. Again, the one thing that we really want to remember is we're not talking about race, nationality, sex, 
economics. We're talking about the giftedness of individuals or the lack thereof. And Paul very clearly uses anatomy as, as being that which allows us to understand that we're not supposed to be identical, cookie cutter. Uh, I heard it phrased like this years ago, and it, it remains with me that God who doesn't make two snowflakes alike certainly desires diversity in the body of Christ. And that idea, I'm told that there's no two snowflakes alike. I haven't checked them all individually, but <laughs> I, I trust that that statement is close enough that, that I can use it as illustration. We're supposed to be different. We are supposed to be. And he, he talks in terms of parts of the body that are uh, more modest, being given greater honor, and he, he talks about the purpose is for unity in the body of Christ. Um, our unity lies not in our uniformity. If I had special points, that would be the first. Our unity does not lie in us being identical. Uh, uniformity is not now, nor has ever been, God's prime desire in the body of Christ. We don't have the same abilities. We don't have the same <coughs> giftedness. Likewise, we are different in other ways. But this text talks about spiritual gifts. And it celebrates. It, it points out that how the body, the anatomy of a human, rejoices over the individuality of the various components. One of the things that he makes clear early on is that uh, he uses words one and many repetitively. One, 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 and then many, many, many. But in between all of that, he talks about the Spirit. Now, it's the one Spirit. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. I, uh, I used to have a bumper sticker that I was very fond of, but it was, it was homemade by a, a friend, and, and so it didn't last long, but it stays with me in memory. He, uh, the fellow that did this, printed them up and said, I want the Spirit called Holy. And in the Bible, there are many spirits, but when Paul talks about the one spirit, he's talking about that spirit that can be lawfully called holy, the third person of the triune Godhead. What does the Holy Spirit do in this text? The Holy Spirit baptizes. The Holy Spirit is given to drink. Now, given to drink, I understand to be sustains empowers. It does for the spirit body what water does to the physical body. How long do you live without water? Shorter. You can go longer without food, I'm told. I haven't tried that either. But I'm told you can go. But, but think back about how we, in the last hundred years in America, have talked about becoming Christian. The classic phrase, is it not, I got saved. That doesn't appear in Scripture. Nor does the idea of praying in order to be Christian. The sinner's prayer. That doesn't appear in Scripture. Repetitively, though, Paul talks about being baptized. Baptism for Paul is not a sign of conversion. It's a moment of conversion. You know, uh, the, the, the act of baptism itself is the sign that I have accepted what Jesus has done for me. 
and and uh, I mentioned it. I believe it was this past week, talking about the uh, uh, fellow down of uh, the Ethiopian eunuch down on the Gaza Way. Uh, Look, here's water. Acts of the Apostles records. What is there to prevent me from being baptized? And and a Jew would say, well, you're Ethiopian. Wrong race, wrong nationality. You're a eunuch. Wrong, wrong physical components. And the response, I believe Holy Spirit inspired is, can't think of a thing. Now, Holy Spirit baptizes. Yes, there's physical agents in that. You know, um, we Methodists, by the way, don't believe that pastors, elders, have any special authority in the sacrament, which is why we don't practice private sacramentalism. Uh, the, the clergy doesn't say Mass every morning as they would in the Catholic Church because we don't believe the pastor has any special authority. Uh, the calling of the pastor is to make sure it's done right and in order. It's the faith of the people, we believe, that energizes the sacrament, baptism, Lord's Supper. But here it's very clear that there may be human agency, but it's in fact the Holy Spirit who baptizes. If, if there's a conversion agent, the conversion agent is God. And that's very clear. But in the God not only through, the, through God the Holy Spirit, God not only converts, God sustains. And, and yes, I'm making much more out of this percentage-wise than the number of words pointed here versus the number of one, words talking about one body, many body, one part, many parts, all that. But it's, it's key. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. What's the point? God not only converts, God not only sustains, it is in God that we find our unity. If you heard me talk Sunday afternoon about the upcoming call general conference, my biggest argument with those that I disagree with is that they find unity in church membership. I believe that we are required, expected, demanded to find our unity and our faith, which requires agreed upon doctrine. We have to have one belief about the one Lord, the one baptism, the one God and Father of us all, Paul will say elsewhere. If there's not unity in doctrine, what could there be unity in? Now, the fact that we're all part of the United Methodist Church, that would make it a club because it would lack core belief in God. I don't know if y'all remember, and I'm not sure if you knew there was going to be a pop test, but in the communion, not in the communion service, in the baptismal service in our hymnal, when you, the audience, the congregation, audience is a bad word, congregation is the correct word, when you, the congregation, uh, read about the Apostles' Creed, it'll have, do you believe in God the Father from the clergy? And the response is, I believe in God the Father. And then there are brackets, and it's to the bracket that I refer to. And then in brackets, I believe in God the Father, maker of, and in brackets, heaven and earth and all, and all, all the way down to the discussion of Jesus Christ. And then the clergy asks the question, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And it says, I believe in Jesus Christ. And then brackets show up. And everything after that, why the brackets? That part's optional. You don't have to believe that in order to be part of the denomination. That's the ruling of general conference. I don't think God would rule the same way. I believe the reason we have historically for two millennia had things like the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, is to guide us in our faith. And if we don't have unity in that, 
how can we be part of one one body? Now again, that's my argument. That's not the argument of the denomination. But I don't see it as being optional. A lot of people today have difficulty with things like the virgin birth. And they're quickly told that, oh, well, that's optional. And if you check what's in brackets, you will discover that for this denomination currently, it is optional. I remember scripture talking about in the Genesis <coughs> prophecy from the father about Mary, the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. What's difficult about that prophecy? I didn't say impossible, I said difficult. What's difficult? The seed of the woman. What's, pro what's problematic about that phrase? Women don't have seeds. No. No. How is it possible that a woman have a seed? It's prophecy of a virgin birth. How can the Father get that wrong and we believe that God is, is Father? If you start picking at one place, mm -hmm. the whole thing unravels. Mm -hmm. If I make virgin birth, if I make any of the historic components of the faith optional, I am not practicing Christianity. And so we talk about the oneness here. Be clear, the oneness belongs, it starts in God, baptized as the Spirit baptized. It continues in God, given the Spirit to drink, to sustain. We start in God, we, we continue in God. Hopefully we will finish in God. But that's the unity here. The oneness is not in ability. It is certainly not in appearance or personality or any of the things that the world calls uh, us to separate over. It's our faith that unifies us. But having said that, then it talks about the many. And again, I remind you, we're bracketed by spiritual gifts. Last week, verses 1 through 11, spiritual gifts. Verse 27 through 31a, spiritual gifts. Body of Christ, part of it, but prophets, apostles, prophets, teachers, workers of miracles, gifts of healing. All these are callings or gifts. And, and, and yeah, um, there is a desire among many people to have the gifts that put one up on the, on the platform, on stage, and apparently make that person more important. And, and Paul is saying, no, no. You know, God orders it as God chooses, but that's not what you're supposed to desire. He concludes, but earnestly desire the greater gifts. And did you notice that the text today ends at 31a? That means the lectionary is openly disagreeing with 31b being part of chapter 12. 31b, most of us nowadays say, is actually Paul's introduction to 1 Corinthians 13. And yet it's a link because 31a, eagerly desire the greater gifts, 31b. And now I, I will show you the most excellent way. What's the one gift he wants us all to have? Love. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the one gift. And so you can't separate 12 and 13. They, they are just a continuation. Uh, you know, uh, the greater gift, the one that all of us should, should seek to strive for is love. Now, again, love here has nothing to do with emotion. It has everything to do with behavior. I love as my behavior presents love. 
love is patient, love is kind, yada, yada. It just goes on. It's all behavior. It's all action. Backing up. Again, talking about giftedness at verse 14. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. Now that may sound silly, but what's being said there is, in all actuality, if, if I'm not the preacher, if I'm not the apostle, if I'm not the teacher, if I'm not the person I want to be, I'm not going to join that church. And Paul repeatedly wants to hold us to the idea that it's God that calls, that God that decides. I would hear in this text the idea that uh, the best calling is the calling God gives. In other words, if my calling is to be the person who cleans the bathroom because it's God that calls me to that, that is in fact the best gift I could get. If you look at text, when there's a time of transition, when there's a time of transition, oftentimes the younger person who transitions into the job of the older person starts off as servant. Mm -hmm. You've got, you know, Moses being followed around and served by Joshua. And all of a sudden, Joshua was in charge of the whole nation. And, and the key on that is, you know, the tent of meeting, Moses, the text says Moses would go out and meet with God at the tent of meeting and then would depart, but Joshua would stay behind. God, Joshua couldn't get enough of God. Moses would, you know, get fed up and leave. Joshua, he's hanging around. But you have the same thing with the, the first disciples and the first Christian martyr. They were called to serve the table, that is, to feed widows. How, how really influential, come on now guys, don't leave me hanging. How influential would it appear to be in the church if the job of a young man was to feed widows? Mm -hmm. Would that be considered the prime job? Oh. And, and, and yet, you know, the next thing you know, Stephen's preaching. And then the next thing you know, Jesus is standing up at the right hand of the Father saying, Daddy, I, I rise to that man's defense. He belongs to me, and he becomes the first martyr of the church for eternity remembered for his great faith. He gets there because he is willing to serve. It's God's idea. And skipping down to verse 22, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Now talking about giftedness and calling and office in the church, what are the jobs that might seem to be weaker? Well, I've already named cleaner of toilets. <laughs> making the tea. <laughs> Make, making the tea and, and coffee. <laughs> And coffee. And cleaning up after, and cleaning up after the men's yeah. breakfast. Amen. Yeah. Uh, those parts are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it. Why? So that there should be no division in the body. Having come to faith in Jesus Christ and become part of the local church, I'm to fit in wherever I fit. And if I'm not where I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to leave God move me. That's interesting. In 35 years, I've never asked for a move. This is the text. Why? If God wants me somewhere else, God will put me where he wants me. The assumption is wherever I am, if God didn't cause it, God at least knows it. I hadn't been forgotten. Now, that's 
a rough overview, and we could talk about the various office, offices, apostle, prophet, teacher, worker of miracles, gifts of healing, speaking in tongues, yada, yada, yada. Uh, we're going to deal with some of that, the tongues and all, in 14. But this is a good overview and, and a good time of transition. What stands out to you? What do you want to say to the text? Or what do you want to ask? I, I read in a devotion this week that, that we need to focus on what we have rather than what we don't have. And when I was reading this as far as part of the body and the gifts and the lesser and the greater and whatever, our human nature is to think about what we don't have and look at somebody that's smarter than we are and say, I wish I had his intellect so I could understand this <laughs> book better. But that, that's just a, a silly, uh, and yet it's true. And and then you look at the fact that that God gives us what we have because that's where he wants us to be. And it's up to us to accept that. And that's the hard part, is we want what we want rather than what God wants. That's, that's what it says to me, is be careful of, of questioning where God puts you. Can I add what I think is the continuation of your sentence? Okay. In addition to everything you've said, I strongly suspect that the office or ability or giftedness of the person we might envy is not near as attractive as we think it is in our ignorance of what it's actually like. This morning, Debbie and I were discussing something that I don't even remember what it was about. And I came out with one of my esoteric quotations. <laughs> Out of the blue, I'm quoting Socrates, and 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 uh, evidently doing it well enough to impress her, which you know sets the bar fairly low. Uh, she gets impressed way too easily, and she asked, she said, "Do you remember everything?" And my response is, "Baby, half the time I don't even know my own name. I don't know why I know what I know." because I'm aware of all the stuff I don't know. Names, you know, when I'm with my youth group, half the time I'll have to point to one and say, you, you know who you are. <laughs> you know, and that's, that, that ends up being what I call them is you <laughs> with my finger pointed at them. Yeah, I don't know why I can remember one thing and can't remember something else or why, you know, but it impressed her because she didn't know what it was like to live inside my head. Mm -hmm. and, and yet in my, inside my head, it's a whole lot stranger than, you know, it may come out in my teaching anyway. I suspect that that may be true for a lot of those that we envy, that the appearance of that is a whole lot more special than the fact of that. Uh, those of you that read uh, our daily text from Seedbed, I reference uh, JD's devotion yesterday, the day before, whatever, when he talks about when he's going to an event that, you know, he's one of the platform speakers. Everybody wants to, you know, talk with him and shake hands. But, you know, during the week when he's running to Kroger to pick up groceries, you know, nobody cares a thing about him. Now, that's that's a loose remembrance of that whole thing, but I, I've got the essence of it. You know, you know when, when, when you're seeing this platform speaker giving the oracle of God with such great power, you know, everybody wants to be that person. You don't know what that's like for them. And I strongly suspect it's not near as, as you know, attractive on that side. We 
in our ignorance of what that person actually is living through don't see it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also halfway remembering quotations from other pastors of previous centuries who talk about uh, uh, having to have ethics and uh, a spiritual life in order just to be able to sustain that calling. You know, that uh, uh, prayer life, life in Christ, Scripture, study and ethics in order just so they don't become one of the many clergy that have fallen mm -hmm. all those so very important that's the second half granny <laughs> <laughs> what else in this passage it's a it's a rich passage 